Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, temporal meetup for uh, November. This is going to be the last meetup uh, of the year. And because uh, it's a short week, we're also going to do a uh, short uh, meetup today. So before we get started, a few housekeeping items, the or actually announcements. The first one is we have a meetup coming up. I'm going to post the link uh, in the chat. We have a meetup coming up in New York, November the 30th at the Datadog headquarters. So if you are around, please uh, come and join us. Then on the other side, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, it's winter, it's New York, it's gonna be cold. No way I'm gonna make it. Don't worry, I have options. Yeah? If you can't be at the East Coast, maybe you can be at the West Coast. We have yet another meetup coming up and that is about a week later, December the 6th. This time in uh, San Francisco, um, Lightstep will be our host. So if you can't make New York, maybe you can make San Francisco. I'm going to uh, post um, that link as well. So today we're going to hear uh, from Height. And if you are a regular, you know that usually I am using the logo of the company, but I saw this graphic on their website and it embodies so well what the company does and it looks pretty cool. So I just had to use that one. And uh, Natalia is gonna tell us about um, Temporal at Kite. So I'm gonna stop the recording and Natalia, please do take it away. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. And start a slideshow. So I think I'm gonna. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you about how we uh, deployed Kite and how we're using uh, how we deployed Temporal and how we're using it at Kite. And I'm just gonna start uh, with uh, explaining who we are and what we do. We are a transportation company. We're a startup, uh, and we're really what we do. We're a new generation car rental. We're not your uh, traditional car rental in the sense that if you if you rent with us, we will bring the car to you. Uh, and then uh, whenever you need it and wherever you need it, we'll bring it and then we'll take it away uh, when you no longer need it. So, oops. Uh, so basically when I started and I started at the company in May, this is what we had. Uh, we have, you know, a user makes a booking and uh, that's a pretty uh, quick uh, synchronous operation. But then once that booking is made, the actual trip could be days or weeks or months away. So once that's the, once that the booking is actually in, uh, we need to start some processing uh, and we need to do some offline things. And you can imagine what those are. We need to charge the, we need to charge the user a deposit. Uh, at some point, a certain time before before their trip starts. We need to notify them several times about things. We need to verify their identity and so forth. And so basically, most of this uh, was off was done offline in a batch fashion. So there is a cron that runs on a cadence and it says, uh, actually, I'm going to go to the next one. So the logic was, give me all bookings that satisfy certain criteria that I'm responsible of, that would be the, the job asking that question. And then it will loop through all of those bookings and perform a certain operation or certain task or a set of tasks on each of them. So now there are problems, of course, that come with the sequential processing. So first of all, each booking's processing is delayed by the processing of all of the bookings ahead of it. And if the task is time sensitive, you can imagine that uh, at the time that a certain thing is executed, it may no longer be relevant, especially when you're working at a large scale. Uh, and any problems will delay some of the, and its its delay will delay some of, some of the other critical tasks that it triggers. And also our, your ability to retry a failure is limited in the sequential fashion because you don't want to spend time and keep retrying a single entity when all those other entities are waiting. So of course the solution to the sequential processing problem is parallelized. 
th that would allow us to scale. Uh, so basically parallelizing would solve the scalability issue, but then it comes with a bunch of other issues. Now we would have to design and maintain this parallelization. We would have to keep track of retries. We would have to persist data and state across restarts. And also we would have to keep track of individual failures and recover from them. So now the answer, delegate. Delegate all of it. So basically, uh, and I'm I'm sorry about this format. I copied it from my blog, <laughs> and I I didn't I I guess I didn't format it uh, for uh, for for a presentation. But this is just the snippet from uh, from my blog. You know, uh, workflows are now a widely accepted industry standard, and then the workflow engine. Uh, takes care of all of the things that I just described, retries, statefulness, scalability, and it allows the developer, basically us, to concentrate on the business logic. And additionally, in a workflow paradigm, we can implement a workflow around a single entity and track that entity, as opposed to our batch job uh, that processes everything in a uh, in a single run. So basically it just shows how the the other picture where we had multiple entities go into a single job is broken down into multiple entities now each running in its own workflow. So basically this is what uh, the advantages and what the workflow solution is giving us. We can now configure a retry policy that's executed in each entity, which could be in our environment. It's like a booking or a trip leg or a user. And the retries, we don't have to, we just set the retry policy and then the retries are fully handled by the workflow engine. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, we can design our process as a set of atomic actions uh, where each action is an activity. It's a workflow activity and it always only run once on success. So we don't have to keep track, also don't have to keep track of the state. Uh, we don't have to keep, keep track of the state of the flow across restarts. Um, and also it allows us, it allows us to track processing of a specific entity via the UI. And this is just like a uh, screenshot from the UI where it shows that we had a workflow and it started, and then it shows us each step, at what point it was executed and what the state of that step was. So I can open my, if, if a user has a problem, if I know what their, some identifier of their trip or of, uh, of their, um, of their account, I can find the specific workflow of the specific type for that specific entity and track it in the UI and see each step in the UI for that entity. So now there, are, there is a number of workflow engines out there and we actually evaluated a number of workflow engines before we started using Temporal. Uh, we looked at Cadence, we looked at um, something called Netflix Conductor and some other ones. Uh, and we had a number of criteria uh, that we associated uh, like weighted scores with. And what was important for us is that it wouldn't be ex extremely expensive for a startup. So, I mean, it's great that it's open source. It has an active community uh, around it. We are mostly currently Python shop. So we needed a Python SDK. And at that point, the Python SDK was in alpha. It's currently in beta. We're using beta three, uh, but it's greatly, like the level of support is just amazing. Uh, it's well. It's very well documented. The server side, as well as the uh, as well as the SDK. So we were able to use the documentation. It's really well structured. Uh, we have a great level of support from from the. Uh, we're all like, we're we're actively we're active on the Slack uh, in the Slack community, and we get answers to our, we get answers to our 
questions almost immediately, especially from the uh, SDK developer. Um, and another thing that was really important to us is that uh, in the world where we run and we're tracking bookings, trips, uh, things change all the time. And so we needed a uh, not something that, you know, there are workflows out there like Airflow that do data processing where you set up a DAG uh, and then sure. you just, you, your workflow, your, your workflow engine runs your predefined workflow. We needed an event driven. We want it to be event driven. Uh, and so it's really important to us that Temporal can listen to signals and it's, it's dynamic. So uh, the history of how we uh, set it up was we started by deploying a self-hosted cluster as a POC. And we started running some workflows in it and our development environment. And mostly we just used it for testing and proving that we could go forward and deploy it in production. But uh, we quickly realized that we just did not have uh, enough uh, IT or infra resources to handle the to, to, to handle the server side of the things because there are problems like we had to authenticate users, authorize so authentication, authorization, uh, exposing exposing the the web UI to um, or limiting the exposure of the web UI, scaling. Uh, all of that, uh, we just did not have, being a small startup, we just did not have enough internal resources. And so we moved to, to the manage, to manage temporal. And basically this, this is what the picture shows that we have a managed temporal. Uh, it actually shouldn't say, yeah, there is some cluster. We basically don't, it's transparent to us. We just see our namespaces. We don't know how the cluster is set up on the temporal side. All we, all we know is that we have our namespaces set up. We currently have a namespace per environment. And then we have our own worker processes that talk to the that talk to Temporal. And we manage all of our workers while Temporal, uh, while Temporal manages the rest for us. Uh, actually, one of the things that was also important when we were evaluating um, evaluating engines, workflow engines, was monitoring. And the temporal, so the, the client side, the temporal SDK has a number of embedded metrics that are emitted via Prometheus. Uh, so we collect in our setup, we collect, collect all metrics and data docs. So we scrape Prometheus endpoints on the workers and collect everything in data dog. And we have a number of dashboards and monitors and alerts uh, that we're watching. And the main ones is that we want to know when something failed, uh, like workflow failed. We also uh, have like heartbeat monitors, making sure that if nothing failed, then it's actually running. So we, we're actually counting completed. And uh, another thing that we're watching for is activity uh, scheduled to start latency to make sure that we can we can scale on our side. We actually haven't seen any scaling problems on the server side with Temporal, but we'll, and we also want to make sure that our workers can scale and can uh and can uh run our workflows uh if if they're time sensitive, we want to make sure that all activities are run just in time. We have so in our setup, we have uh, we have a production environment. We also have a development environment, and the development environment is connected to Dev development namespace. So basically, it's also hosted by Temporal. But we also wanted to uh, we we wanted to empower our users to do some a lot of local testing without the overhead. Of going connecting to the uh, to the actual to the actual temporal server, so for local testing, we're using something called uh, Temporal Lite. This is just a distribution of Temporal, uh, and it's running in a single process with no runtime dependencies. And we have a uh, I actually 
have this really simple uh, Docker Compose file that starts to, starts Temporal Light. So basically, any developer can just start Temporal Light and start running workflows locally. And a lot of the logic that they have will cannot really be run locally. It requires other uh, setups and connections to production systems. But orchestration for testing just the orchestration part of the workflow, it works perfectly. So when we started deploying uh, workflows at scale, we started running into, we ran into a number of problems. So our first pitfall was long running activities. The way that we do things, we do full deployment on every code change. So if someone lands their someone lands their code. And, and the grid usually, you know, not guarantee offtake. Oops. Uh, so we do full deploy, which means that we redeploy our workers. We cycle our workers frequently. And when it happens during the day, it could be people could be landing code every five to 10 minutes. So what happens is that um, what happened in our environment was that uh, we had long running activities, say an activity runs and it sleeps, wakes up, does something, sleeps again. So an activity runs on a cadence. So what would happen was a worker would take this activity and run it. And then some, and then someone would merge in some code and we would redeploy and the worker would go away and be replaced by a new one. But because it was not checking in with the server, the server had no idea that the worker went away. And so it would just wait for that activity to time out fully for the start to close timeout value. And that could be days, like for some of the activities, it's like we have two days. So our activities seemed stuck. And then we, that was one of the problems that we saw. And then we realized that that was because our workers were redeployed and going away. And once we added heartbeats to our activities, so into that loop where it sleeps, does, does something, sleeps again. It also, every time it wakes up, it sends a heartbeat. So it checks with the server, checks in with the server. And so if it stops checking in, then the server knows this worker's gone, so it will hand this activity to another worker. That's how we uh, that's how we resolved our uh, the first pitfall. This was oh, and I I missed this one. So another problem that we had was our worker scalability. Uh, we also had this problem where our worker workers our activities just seemed stuck, like they wouldn't run. Uh, and we don't even have a really high load. We have like a few thousand workflows per day uh, we, with, with several activities running in parallel. So we couldn't figure out what was going on. And then we checked in with the temporal team and it turned out that when a worker object is created uh, via the temporal SDK, it's, it's configured to handle a certain number of parallel activities. So once it gets to that number, it just stops asking the server for the for activities. And that's why, because the number in the beta SDK that we were using by default was pretty low. I think it was like a hundred. Um, our activities seemed stuck because the workers would stop asking the server to hand them more activities. So we increased that number like, to to hundred thousand and it's it's all working perfectly now. Um, I, I actually don't know what the default is in, in the new version of the Python SDK, but the lesson learned was always check your configuration. Um, now, I think uh, on everywhere in temporal on the temporal documentation uh, in big letters. It says that the workflow uh, code must be fully deterministic. So it shouldn't have any non-deterministic uh, calls in it. And it, sh and it cannot be changed in a backward and compatible ma ma manner. So there, there are, 
well-known solutions to that. So you should be using the temporal versioning API that we're actually using. Uh, we also try now, we try to test for non-determinism using, using the preplayer API. However, things will still get into production with non-determinism errors in them. Some Someone would, did not pay attention when they made the change or someone did not pay attention when they did a code review. And so we have like things, we have thousands of workflows running in production and they are, and they are time sensitive. Like they say they're notifying users about something. So it's a little too late to go back and try to do it the right way. Uh, so what we did, this is the solution that we're using. We just restart everything that's running. And in our setup, we can do that. Like our workflows are fully idempotent and they can be restarted from scratch. And we're using T control for that. So I just attached this command that we're using to, uh, to reset everything of a certain type that's currently running in prod. And that's how we get around, that's currently how, how we get around any non-determinism error that's deployed with a new code deploy. I guess that's all I had, uh, and I'd be willing to take any questions if anyone has questions. Thank you very much. If anybody has questions, please do go ahead, uh, unmute yourself, or also post them in the in the chat. Hi there. I uh, see one question. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Natalia, thank you very much. That was really interesting um, and useful for me to hear just as a uh, kind of newcomer to Temporal, seeing how folks are doing things in the real world. Um, I'm curious, are you using the Python SDK you said? Um, are you using um, async or synchronous activities? Async. Okay, cool, thank you. I I have a question. Please. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, it's not green. Uh, anyways, um, so you showed the metrics with the workflow completed metrics, and you said those are SDK metrics because I somehow lost mine and my Grafana dashboard is empty. Um, are these really client side metrics? Shouldn't this yeah. be emitted from the server? Uh, I so I wouldn't know what we can see on the server. It's what's shown to us. Other other than what's shown to us in the UI, the server is a black box to us. So there could be some, and you know, Dominic could probably answer that question. But we're we're monitoring only client side metrics, and this is a client side metric. And there okay. there are, there's probably. A similar, there was similar data uh, available on the server, Spe especially considering that the the client the client communicates with the server all the time, so the server would know everything that you know that the client sells it. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, I have one question. Thank you for your sharing. My question is, uh, you mentioned the. Uh, uh, this is a workload code change, right? So I can understand you use the version to control the backward compatibility. Mm -hmm. But my problem is if let's say the TCT command itself release a new version, in this sense, how we are going to, for example, re-download this one into the worker and do the necessary check. The, the T control, so T control the T control command uh, goes directly to the server. Okay, so and you let me. I try to. nothing. It has nothing to do with the client. It goes directly to the. It talks to the server. It goes directly to the server, and issues a request to the server to reset the workflows. So it's the server doing that, not the client. And the client will just the client will just uh, start polling for work again. Uh, because we use the TCT to talk with the other worker to understand the, the cluster is set up properly. So in that sense, we need the latest version of the TCTO. 
in the worker node. I see. Oh, you're you're you have your you you need it installed on the worker node. Yes. So, yes. And yeah, we need that's, to that's always down, mm -hmm. and, and always download the latest version of the TCTL. Yeah, that's a question for uh, that's a question for Temporal. How you can okay, track okay. how you can track those releases and make sure that you're up to date. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Thank no, you. Frank, if you are not on uh, the Temporal Slack, and uh, also true for, for everybody, if you're not on the uh, Temporal uh, Slack yet, please go ahead and uh, join our uh, Slack. I will post uh, the link in just a moment. First, I would like to post the link to um, Natalia's blog post uh, came out uh, this morning where you can catch up on the presentation as well. It's a fantastic blog post. I really enjoyed reading it. And then uh, in order to uh, join the conversation on uh, Slack, please vi uh, visit temporal.io slash okay. uh, Slack okay. also in the uh, chat uh, right now. Okay. okay, thank you. And then uh, Natalia, thank you very much. I am very happy to hear that uh, A, uh, you have a great experience with the technology itself, but B, also thank you very much for the kind words about your experience with the uh, Temporal community and then also with the uh, uh, Temporal uh, developers. I'm pretty sure they're going to be stoked and very happy to hear uh, your your kind words and positive feedback. Yeah, sure. So, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very I'll, much. Have to, I'll have to drop because I, I have something else. So thank you so much for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Okay. Then without further ado, and without the detour to, to the slide, I will uh, hand over right away to my uh, colleague, uh, Pierre, who will uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Temporal Cloud today. Cool. Thanks, Dominic. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm assuming yes. Perfect. Yep. All right. Awesome. Uh, well, excited to give you guys a, a quick update on uh, on Temporal Cloud. There's been a lot of changes uh, happening this quarter. Uh, some really exciting news on our side. Um, and so, kind of, I'm gonna go through like a little bit what has changed, and then talk a bit about the the roadmap, um, and then I have plenty of time for for you guys' question. Um, Okay, so like big announcement. I think you guys uh, hopefully have seen the, the blog post and I don't know if you've seen the news, uh, but we are now in uh, what we call expanded access, which is kind of like a, an interesting name. And so I'm going to talk a minute about what we mean by that and why it's important for us. Um, but so where where is Temporal Cloud? So we're absolutely running customer production application. You just saw Kai today. Uh, and then we have many, many more customer uh, using Temporal Cloud. Uh, available in a bunch of region, scale to like really large uh, number of what we call action. Think of them as like APIs basically going to us. Uh, and so really kind of like running, um, you know, customer production application and, and adding um, a lot of customer every week. Um, so it's been, it's been really positive and really exciting for us. Um, so that has been a, a big news. The team has been working really hard on that. So why do we call expanded access? Well, the first thing we really focused on was really allowing to not have any more wait lists. Like in the past, you used to connect to the Temporal website and you connect and it was more like a wait list. The wait list is gone. Now, if you go and sign up for the cloud, uh, well, you have access to the cloud. Um, and so we're really excited to do that. But why did we call that expanded access and not generally available is we really want to enable you know temporal for anyone uh, companies as well as individuals and uh, we're still in a place where we kind of like actively working toward that and so because of those reasons that's why we kind of like um, call it uh, expanded access so what it means it still means a, it's going to take like less than a week to get onboarded honestly we do that uh, almost on a daily manner but then still kind of like sign up for the cloud you get access a couple of days after that that's the first thing and then it still requires our production support. And that's one of the, the big things for us. We still target really, you know, companies basically that are kind of like uh, running and that wants to run Temporal in production. Uh, and so that's the big reason why we kind of like stick to a name expanded access and want to open it to like generally available when we feel like anyone can get access to it. It's just easier and, and things like that. 
Um, so it's a really exciting news. Um, so yeah, if if you're interested, um, go go use the cloud. Um, we're really excited to to get your production uh, application running with us. And then we have done a lot of things. And so I'm. This is a heavy slide. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything. I'm probably going to talk about some of the the key elements that are coming here. Uh, I'm kind of like going to focus first on you know what we have delivered as part of Q3 and Q4, which is kind of like when we've moved for the private beta expanded access. And then I'm going to talk more about 2023. I'm not kind of like giving uh, much of like, okay, which one is coming in Q1, Q2, or if it's past 2023 going to like further than that. But I want to give you guys a sense of where we are going and all the really cool stuff that we have been working on. The first thing, um, I know when we talked about the cloud, we really see that as namespace as a service. And so I know what, when you use self-hosted version of Temporal, you are used to managing a cluster. You know, we just saw uh, Natalia talk about it or things like that. But once you use the cloud, we really want to give you the flexibility and the ease of use of really consuming namespaces. And so you have a namespace, you create your namespace, you manage your namespace, and then you use your workflow and code the way you are. But you're not exposed to what like a cluster would be or anything like that. We really take all of that uh, on our side and really just make it easy for you guys to consume it. So as part of our private beta and public beta, really we focus on like this experience of the namespace as a service, allowing you to create user, allow you to put like an RBAC system where you can define an administrator versus a dev versus someone that would be read only. We allow you to enable the creation of namespace on demand, update them, and we added basically as part of, uh, we're adding as part of NQ4, like a delete namespace also. So now you can really have the full life cycle of a namespace. Natalia talked just earlier, and I think Maxime, you replied to that. Uh, Natalia talked about uh, just earlier how she's looking at uh, the SDK side of uh, the metrics and observability. Well, actually, we also expose that from a cloud standpoint. Um, it's using PromQL, uh, so if you have Grafana, it's really easy to access it. If you have Datadog, we're giving you a script right now to enable to connect to it. Uh, reach out to us if you have any question on that. But we do expose namespace side metrics. So if you want to see some information about your namespace, you can absolutely get that information and combine that with your SDK information. We also give you information about your usage and like how much action and storage and things like that you are using uh, as part of the product. Uh, we worked on giving you like longer retention period. You've seen also on the uh, OSS side that we kind of like start increasing and allowing to have like longer retention period for your closed workflow. And so absolutely something that we enable in the cloud. Um, and so those are kind of like the, the key thing that we focus in, in, in the first quarter. And then uh, for enterprises or large enterprises that have like private uh, connectivity requirements, um, one of the key things that um, AWS support is something called uh, private connect, um, private link, and so kind of like enable the support to connect directly to your namespaces uh, using technology like private link. Where we are, and then a lot of work also has been done on the kind of like what we call data converter and uh, connecting with it. One of the really cool things about the cloud is like you run your code. Your worker is yours, you know, you run it yourself. And then really what you do is basically leverage the cloud to connect to it and connect to your namespaces. We don't want to see any data. If you use the data converter running basically with your SDK, none of the data that comes to the cloud is visible by us. It's totally encrypted, you manage it. And so that's one of the really beautiful thing about kind of like the connectivity to the cloud uh, for you guys when you use it. It's part of the expanded access. We really wanted to finish wrapping up, you know, kind of like all those features and security and scale that you expect, basically. And so I mentioned a delete namespace. The other big one is just account logging in general. If you want to know who did what, where, when, you know, you created a user, you created a namespace, you updated a custom search attributes or certificate or things like that. Having all that data available, um, that feature is coming out in a couple of weeks. It's basically going to be allowing you to connect to Kinesis and kind of like pass on that information. We also worked all the time really, really hard around our infrastructure, optimizing our infrastructure to enable like higher and higher and higher throughput use cases. Reach out to us if you have those needs. Uh, but we really, really done a lot of like intense scaling and intense testing on that to really go after really big um, super use cases. 
One of the feature we just added, a lot of enterprises asking us for that is SAML and SSO integration. So uh, if you have connected to the cloud, uh, typically we used to uh, ask you to use um, Google social connection. Uh, so we have using we have now use uh, Google social. We have also Microsoft uh, social if you have it. Um, but know also that uh, we support SAML and SSO integration. If that's something you're interested in, just to open a support ticket uh, with us or reach out to the sales team if you're working with sales team. And uh, we kind of like uh, have now that support uh, as part of the cloud. One of the big features that uh, is also supported on the open source side that we are bringing to the cloud. If you guys haven't checked those features yet, please do around batch terminate. You guys have seen that uh, since 118. And then also working really hard to get a uh, scheduled workflow, kind of like the Nucron. A lot of people really getting good feedback on that. And we want to enable this feature uh, on the cloud really fast. And so kind of like working actively on that. Now looking ahead, so all of that is basically what you, you're getting um, more or less basically, but that's kind of like what's coming this year. And so once you get to the cloud and sign up to the cloud, the, you're getting all of this. Looking ahead, where are we going basically uh, in terms of like some of the really important feature and what we're working on on, a, you know, on the cloud? Um, Today, as I mentioned, we really need, uh, uh, work with this namespace as a service notion. And so we want to, uh, you to allow to simplify the management of it. And that means simplifying and having like a hierarchy that can follow your organization where you can have your accounts, but then you can have folder, organization, and then your namespaces. So really working hard to simplify all of that so you can manage groups and roles and, and also for bidding. This is interesting for people. Uh, one of the features that has been asked a lot, if you guys are familiar, it's called archival on the open source side. Um, so we want to enable you to export your event history uh, from the cloud. And so something that we are actively working hard on it. So you could basically like send your event history to like an S3 bucket or something and you manage it. And now you, you have access to that. Um, on the reliability side, a lot of really, really cool feature around cross-regional failover. Uh, if you have needs around that, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, this is a really, really important feature for us where we see a lot of value added and a lot of like uh, value that you can get from, from the cloud on that, allowing you to fail between a region to another region or things like that. Uh, a lot of really cool stuff. Temporal is committed uh, to always make sure that you can run uh, your workflow, you know, in your self-hosted environment or in the cloud. And we want to enable this migration back and forth. Uh, it's something that's really important to us. We really truly believe that you want to be able to have um, this movement and be able to decide what makes more sense for you guys and really feel that, hey, you know, if the cloud is a good solution for you, great. But if self-hosted is a better solution, do it or vice versa. Uh, and so we want to enable this migration. And so a lot of things we optimization we want to do in order to uh, help you uh, work on that. And then more work around kind of like the dashboarding and, and logging and visibility. And that's part of that reliability work. In terms of scale, uh, we're adding more AWS region. Uh, that's where we are today. We're still going to like work a lot this year through that. But kind of like looking past uh, that, um, then we're also going to want to support more cloud. And so kind of like something that we are starting to think about, are we going to get this year or like later on this one? It's still like depending on, on the prioritization we're going to go, but something that we are absolutely kind of like considering and, and wanting to do. In terms of security, uh, one of the key requested feature, you're going to see that, actually see that one coming in Q1 this year. Uh, next year, I should say, uh, API key support. Right now, if you use the cloud, we ask you to use MTLS to connect uh, to the cloud for your worker as well. And so it's kind of like um, sometime uh, a bit more tricky for companies to manage, especially if you don't have your own mechanism to manage keys and thing, um, um, certificates. And so really bringing API keys for you uh, make all of that easier. It's also going to help uh, with automation and this namespace automation creation, namespace uh, user automation and, and things like that. So something that's important. And then we still want to work on the private connectivity. I mentioned private link. We want to simplify the connectivity with it. We want to make it easier for you to create a private link connection and create namespace or things like that. Uh, so something that's really important to us. And then uh, more support. Today we are SOC to compliance, something that's really important for many, many companies 
but eventually we want to support more compliance like PCI or things like that. And uh, one of the key features that we keep on hearing uh, that we are really working hard on the OSS side is working with uh, synchronous updates and kind of like working on that detail. And so eventually kind of like also see supporting those type of um, you know, use cases that could be like lower latency and, and things like that. So in general, a big roadmap, as you can see, and maybe I moved a, a bit fast to that. So happy to, you know, answer any question. But as you can see, we've been really hard at working, getting to that expanded access, basically phase, really working through that. And then a lot of really, really cool feature kind of like uh, looking ahead for us. I'm going to pause here and uh, open up for question. Pierre, thank you. Um, super, super interesting. Uh, I have a question about uh, API key support. Is that something that will be offered in the open source SDKs? So it's kind of like really something that we are building up around uh, Temporal. So what we have done in general is like making sure that all the right hooks are in place or things like that. But the management of the API keys themselves, think of it as like, you know, creating them and connecting and logging and all of that. That's typically kind of like surrounding kind of like Temporal itself. And that's part of the, you know, feature that we have in the cloud. Um, so that's typically where you would see it, but nothing would be preventing you kind of like building that yourself, I would say around, around OSS too. But maybe something we can talk offline also with, I don't know if Ryan is on the call. Thank you. Dominic, I don't know. Any other questions? That. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. If, if, there, if there are no uh, other questions, uh, we can give everybody a 15 minute uh, back uh, for that day. So uh, just as a reminder, as I said, uh, this is uh, uh, last meetup in uh, 2022. If you uh, celebrate uh, Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving, uh, have, a, have a great rest of your week. And then also if you uh, celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas and uh, have a happy new year. And uh, we see all of you back in uh, 2023. And uh, yeah, I post the link to our Slack community one more time. If you're not on Slack uh, yet, please join and um, reach out. Re uh, reach out if you want to, reach out to me directly and say hi. And uh, then, yeah, we're going to see each other again in 2023. Thank you very much and uh, have a great, uh, great rest of 2022. Bye-bye.